Good morning. Um, Welcome to Northminster Church. Myself, Julia, along with Pastor Ken, would like to uh, just say hello, and we are glad you are here. (laughs) Um, Let's go ahead and um, open in prayer. We got word from the Rocky Point Mission team that things are going really well there, so that's a praise God moment. Um, And then Pastor Andy slash my dad leaves today for the Holy Land, so... Um, We'll definitely incorporate them in our prayer today. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and the glorious weather that you've brought to us. Uh, We thank you for the people who have chose to come here this morning and worship you and just our chance to worship together as a family of Christ. We thank you and praise you for the blessings that are happening on our Rocky Point mission trip, God. What a blessing it is to those who are serving as well as those who are going to be getting a new home this weekend. Um, You are the foundation underneath our feet and we just praise you and thank you for the resources to be able to put a foundation under a family's feet. We ask that you continue to bless those who are there, uh, bring them safety as they travel home, God, and we, uh, we again just thank you and give you all the glory. We ask that you be with Pastor Andy, God, as he um, does last-minute preparations for his trip to the Holy Land, God. We ask that uh, you would put safety upon him as he travels and and open his his heart up to what you would have him experience there, God. Um, We thank you for the opportunity um, that you have allowed him in traveling there. Be with us as we worship God. Let the word soak into our hearts and minds. And in Jesus' name, amen. Sorry, I thought I was missing a song. I found it. All right. Let's go ahead and stand and sing together. All right. I have to get situated. Okay. All right. Good morning. You ready to sing? Oh, good. Ken is ready. Okay, great.
Our next song is You Are My Vision, and you might have heard this tune as Be Thou My Vision before, um, but this version, it changes it to You Are My Vision, and just kind of more about declaring who God is and acknowledging that he is already all of these things for us, our King and our Redeemer. You are my vision, O King of my heart. Nothing else satisfies only you, Lord. You are my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, your presence my light oh you are my wisdom you are my true word I ever with you and you with me Lord you're my great father and I'm your true Son, you dwell inside me, together we're one. Oh, you are my battle shield, sword for the fight. You are my dignity. catch my breath. The two-handed thing, man. Um, okay, thank you all again for coming. I'm Kaylee Hoy. If you weren't here uh, right at the start of the service, um, we are so glad you are here this morning. Um, what an awesome thing to just take a moment and breathe. I know uh, sometimes our work week or school week or whatever week can get crazy, so it's just nice to put that aside and just listen. 
Uh, so here at Northminster, our purpose and goal is our three things, connect, grow, and serve all in and through Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to grab your bulletin as I go through um, our announcements today. So the first section of our bulletin is ways we can connect in Jesus. Uh, make sure you fill out that white welcome card. There's pillars by all of our doors on your way out. You can slip them in the slot, and that'll let us know you are here today. Um, it not only serves that purpose, but it also um, serves the purpose of prayer requests or praise. You can sign up for classes that way, so make sure you utilize that white card. Guys, Monday Night Madness continues, so if you weren't able to catch the first couple, um, it's not too late for you to join in on that. And then there's also a Men's Fat Tuesday breakfast, whatever that means. It's on Tuesday, it's on Tuesday and you get... And you get fat. I think it's before Ash Wednesday where we might. It's the Tuesday before Ash Wednesday. So come get fat at that men. Um, for everyone else, for us women and men and children, we have an awesome Ash Wednesday experience. Um, there's a more family-oriented, interactional um, thing going on in our fellowship hall. I know people have been very hard at work putting that together. Um, and then there's also a, a thing going on in the sanctuary where you come and get your ashes in the morning. 6.30 to 8.30 in the morning. Okay, but the, the Ash Wednesday night thing is in the fellowship hall. Look at your bulletin. <laughs> okay, growing, growing in Christ. There's tons of classes. Make sure you check out those. They're for all ages. It's happening all throughout the week. Um, so I'm sure there's a class that you could find. There's life share groups starting as well. Um, so you can check out our online resources for what classes that might be available to you. And then finally, serving in Jesus. That's the last section of our bulletin. Um, we would love you to visit our Be a Volunteer booth and check out ways you can maybe serve in the Tucson Festival of Books that's coming up. There's a giving wall out there for a Yucatan fundraiser, the mission trip coming up this summer. Yes. Cool. Make sure you go by the giving wall. Yeah. It's like the best display ever. <laughs> that Ken has worked very hard on. Um, today we have some special guests with us today from Faith That Works, and they're here to share about how we can get involved in that. So good morning. My name is Kevin Oxnum. Um, I attend St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, and we are part, uh, this is Ruth Ann Smithrood, and we are part of a group called Faith That Works Tucson. We've spun off and are now a separate uh, 501c3 organization. We were started by St. Andrew's. We've got a brief history that we can go through. This was started about six years ago at St. Andrew's. We do a lot of different ministries, but the one here we'd like to talk to you about today is the sh mobile shower unit that we purchased. So about six years ago, we purchased this unit. It has uh, two sides to it, three showers on each side, so six showers total, and a sink on each side also, so we have a men's side and a women's side. And we take this out and, to the areas where the homeless are and allow the homeless to get a shower. If you think of all the challenges that you might face if you were homeless, getting a shower has gotta be one of the most difficult things there is. And one of the hardest things is to get clean. This offers the homeless a chance to get in a shower. We've got hot water heaters on board so they can get in there and enjoy a shower and get clean. We try to supply them with clean underwear, socks, sometimes shoes and shirts to help them have some clean clothes to put on when they're done there. Um, this is a picture of the shower unit as it looks from outside. It's a trailer, literally pull it behind a, a van that we also own. And uh, we're trying to expand our ministries right now. We'd love to get more folks involved in this because what's limiting us from getting the shower unit out there is volunteers. We need more volunteers to, to get it out there. The demand is much higher than we have the volunteers to be able to supply. So Ruth Ann has been out with the shower unit many times and she has a couple stories she wanted to tell you today about what it's like for those who are enjoying the shower unit. So you know how the Lord uses different moments to imprint something on your heart and you just never forget those moments? There have been a couple of those times for me. One was um, a, a time at Casa Maria Soup Kitchen, and we met a woman who was probably my age, and she came different times to take a shower. 
And finding out more about her, she was educated, she had a good job, she had a home, and then she got sick. So she had no family in town, so when she got sick, she lost her job, then she lost her home, and everything she had was in a shopping cart. It, the, the thing that really struck me is that I could be her. Um, something could happen to me, and I could wind up on the street just like she did. So I, never, I just don't forget that. When I take a hot shower at home, I just remember all the people that don't have that um, capability or that um, chance to do that. My second little story is um, about a man we met at Z Mansion. He was thrilled to be able to take a shower because he hadn't had one in a very long time. And when he came out, um, he was very sociable, very friendly, and he, uh, we asked him if he needed prayer, and so he said yes, and he wanted prayer for his safety. So after a while, he finally decided to leave, and before he left, he turned around, and I said, do you, do you need something else? And he said, I just want to thank you for giving us back our dignity. This is a real need in our community, and we have this resource that we can use to help fill this need, but we need your help. If, if you would consider volunteering to help us get the showers supplied to those who are homeless, if you can't do that, if you'd look at financial donations, like I said, we are now a standalone 501c3 organization, and we've got to find a source of money to keep this going. We qualify for the Arizona tax credit for charitable organizations, so if you're not using that, we'd love to see if you could help us with that to keep these showers going and be able to donate this. We also would love to have more supplies, shoes, shirts, clean underwear, clean socks that we can donate to those who are homeless. Uh, I know the first thing I would do when I come out of the shower is I want to put on clean clothes because I don't want to wear yesterday's clothes, right? And some of these folks are wearing clothes for many days. So it's lovely to be able to offer them that. Uh, Ruth Ann's contact information is up there. We have flyers. We actually brought the shower unit today. So it's right out here in the corner of the parking lot. If you want to tour it, please come by after the service just to see what it looks like. If you're interested in volunteering, if you could sign up, we'd put you on the list so that we can send you notices when the sign-up sheets are available. If you're looking for a list of supplies that we could use, we have those out in flyers and brochures that are out by the shower unit. So please come uh, see us. If you have any questions, we'd be, do our best to answer those. Uh, Charlotte, who's another one who works on the shower unit, is out there now. And uh, Charlotte was just telling somebody after to the last service she goes it's so wonderful because the homeless are so grateful they appreciate us so much and we get god bless you and thank you so much from them when we're out there helping them they really do know that this is a gem and if uh, anything you could do to help us keep it going we would really appreciate it so faith that works tucson.org is our website and there's a lot of information on there if uh, you can't stop by after the service so thank you for your time and attention and your consideration of helping us if you can For our community time, um, this is when we try to uh, just get in the groups like three or four um, people around you. Uh, this is what I'd like you to do. I think we have like three or four minutes. If you could share with the people in your little group, share if you've ever broken or fractured a bone, okay? What was it? You know, what did you break or fracture? Um, when did it happen? How did it happen? And uh, did it heal completely? Or how long did it take to heal? How long did it take to heal? Okay, so did you break or fracture something? Um, when did it happen? What was it? And how long did it take to heal? Okay? So move around and get into some groups. Or Good morning, and uh, good morning to all those of you who are streaming us live right now. There are 11 o'clock Kaleidoscope service. We're so glad that you can uh, join us, and we hope this worship experience will be a blessing to you. I'm Pastor Ken, and along with our music team, we want to welcome you, and uh, we want to connect with you as well. So uh, check out our website or text us, send us an email. We'd love for you to become a part of our church family, even beyond uh, worshiping with us. 
Have a wonderful and blessed day. Or you can just keep talking. <laughs> okay, that's great. It's a good thing, I think. It's a good thing. Did um, Miranda ever call you? Not that uh, I... Did they... Did you give him my cell? I don't know what oh. he gave. Okay. Um, so, what I asked you to share, it, 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 uh, it'll be a part of uh, the message today. It's not just a random question that I got you to ask. And I'll, I'll tell you about a fracture uh, story in my life. So, uh, so we're continuing our uh, sermon series, 2020 um, Vision. And we're going to be uh, focusing. See what I did there? Focusing, 2020 Vision. See how I... Okay, we're going to be going to a letter, it's the letter of Galatians, written by this apostle, Paul, and it's Galatians 6, 1 through 10. I think it's going to be on the wall, you can use the Bibles you brought, it's going to be on the wall, there we are, here we go. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. 
but watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and if this way, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone, without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load, or own burden. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things and their, with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot, or you could translate God will not, be mocked. A person, a man, or a woman, reaps what they sow. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh they will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest, if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for revealing yourself in your word and revealing instructions to us and encouragement and comfort to us and challenge so that we can become more and more in the likeness of Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, I was with a group of pastors like, I don't know, like three or four months ago, and we got onto the topic of preaching and sermons, and uh, the consensus was that really good preachers don't tell jokes before their sermons. Uh, and since I'm not a really good preacher, I'm better, uh, I'm going to tell you a couple jokes, okay? How many, and it has to do with vision, right? Our, our 2020 vision, that's our, okay, so. How many optometrists does it take to screw in a light bulb? I have no idea. You tell me. One or two? One or three? Three or four? Yeah, see? See? Yeah, now? I know, I know. Come on, that's, yeah. Okay, good. So, uh... <laughs> What do you call an optometrist that helps the police solve crimes? A private eye. Okay, one more. And don't any of you dare say amen. Okay, that's not, that's not fair. <laughs> what did one eye say to the other eye? Huh, just between you and me, something smells. Yeah, you, 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 but you're going to tell these later to people. And yeah, okay. So here we go. Uh, so as we look at Paul's letters, um, we always need to kind of keep why they're written in the back of our minds. And they're written for primarily two reasons. One is that Paul and or someone that was with Paul at the time, they've planted churches all around the Roman Empire. Right? They've planted churches, they've come into a town, they've brought the gospel. People now believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They've become followers of Jesus, Gentiles and Jews, right? And a community forms, and then they need to start meeting. They, they get organized, right? And so, but now what do they do? And so Paul will write, it, this is in every one of his letters, every one of his letters, you'll, you'll find this. He'll write, to these churches to help get them organized, to teach, to instruct, to set up elders and deacons and leaders, to make sure that the fruit of the Spirit is being practiced, to make sure the gifts of the Spirit are being practiced because God promises to give those gifts to his people. And because Paul wants those churches to grow and he wants them to be healthy. Okay, so basic instruction. The second primary reason, and you find this, in every one of Paul's letters as well. So find both of these things, and he kind of goes back and forth, back and forth all the time, is that for some reason, uh, sometimes we know 
why, and sometimes we don't know why. We, kind of, we have to guess a little bit. Um, there's been some kind of division or conflict that has happened in that church. And someone has either written back to Paul or someone has traveled to where Paul is. And they've said, Paul, something has gone wrong. You need to help us out. And so Paul will write a letter, okay? Or, or Paul will write something. And so as we get to the book of Galatians, that's what you find here. There's some issues going on in the book of Galatians. And sometimes, again, as I said, you kind of have to read between the lines a little bit to try to figure out what is happening and why is Paul addressing certain issues. Because sometimes the issues are closely knitted together and sometimes they're just kind of loose and they're flying around a little bit. And you kind of, like, why is he, why did he say that? And then he says this and it, there's no connection. So as we look at these 10 verses, try to keep um, that in mind. Especially when it comes to applying these verses to our own life. And it seems to me that one of the issues that is uh, one of the heresies or one of the conflicts or divisions that is happening in this church is that there are certain people in this church that are taking advantage of other people who are not as spiritually mature. And not only are they taking advantage of them, but they're propping themselves up to make them look better. And Paul says, that is not the kind of behavior that it should be happening in the church of Jesus Christ. So, um, Paul then goes on to what we are going to do about it, right? So therefore, what is the right response to those? And our first part, it seems that there's, there's a person or persons who are struggling with sin. Okay? And so how are we to respond to that? Um, now, whenever Paul talks about how we're to behave towards each other, he al there's always a theological anchor there. And that theological anchor is we treat others in the way Christ has treated us. Okay? You all with me? So, we love others. Why? Because Christ first loved us. We forgive others because Christ first what? forgave us, and so on, and so on, and so on. I mean, you go, you, there's a whole list that you can go through. We do this because Christ first did this to us. And that is the starting point for Paul, and it should be the starting point for us in all kinds of issues. Uh, take, for example, racism. What fuels racism? What fuels racism is the belief that you are more worthy than another person. That's what fuels racism. That's what's behind it. Somehow, you've been taught, or you believe, um, that you have more worth than another person. Well, if you take that theological premise of, and Paul uses the phrase, the law of Christ, love one another as I have loved you, it's impossible to be a Christian. It's impossible to be a person that's living in the Spirit and by the Spirit to also be a racist at the same time. You can't do that. Because you're to love one another as Christ has loved us. <laughs> and so you, there's, 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 a, there's a variety of practical ways in which we live out this, this theological perspective that the way we act is, is because of the grace that Christ has shown us. You know, as Christians, we're not, not racist because it's illegal or because it's culturally unacceptable or socially unacceptable. That's not, that's not why. It's because of the way Christ has loved us. And Paul applies that now to this situation in the Galatian church. So Paul carries this, he calls it the law of Christ, teaching forward as he seeks to encourage the early church and how they are to behave towards each other. And so our passage starts off today answering this question. How is the body of Christ to relate to a believer who has been overtaken by sin? And let me explain that. And the first verse is, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin. Now there's a, a number of different um, Greek words that convey the idea of sin. 
And the word here, the, the word here conveys the idea of a person being overwhelmed or being wrestled down by sin. Uh, Paul's not talking here about like an individual act. You know, it's like, oh, I, you know, I saw Kaylee like not tell the whole truth once. That's not what Paul's talking about. Or, oh, Kaylee got upset with Ross, her little baby boy, and she should have... That's not what Paul's talking about here. Paul's talking about a person who... There's even an element of surprise here. You know, have you ever been driving a car, driving your car, or walking, and you're not quite paying attention the way you should be, and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, where did he come from? Where did she come from? Or, wow, how did I get over into that lane? It's kind of like that. And, and it's, so it's this person who now finds themselves kind of overwhelmed or wrestled down by sin. You know, if you think about one of the characteristics of sin, it takes us by surprise at times, doesn't it? If, if you think about that. And then we're like, oh, where did that come from? Or, wow, I don't usually talk like that. Or where did that attitude come from? Or how did I find myself in this mess? And that's what's happening here in the Galatian church. There's people, they've, they kind of got overwhelmed or wrestled down by sin. And Paul says, okay, how are you supposed to deal with this? You know, the reformers, the reformers taught that there are three primary functions that need to be practiced for a church to exist. Three primary functions. And here they are. Preaching of the word, celebration of the sacraments, practice of church discipline. They're not the only functions, okay? But they're the three primary ones. That's what the Reformers taught. And if you look at these first two, the first two we're good with, right? Preaching and the sacraments, we understand. They're pretty clear. It's that third one, though, that we're a little fuzzy with, and most of us don't want to touch with a hundred-foot pole. In fact, <laughs> that's, that's your job, Ken, if there's any disciplining to be doing in the church, you're the pastor, you do it. <laughs> and Paul says, eh, no, 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 no. And we're going to get to that a little bit later. The important part is the goal. The goal, Paul makes very clear, is to restore. Right? It is to restore, and then he adds this little word, gently restore gently. So it's not just what you do, it's how you are to do it. And so Paul says, look, Church of Jesus Christ, it is inevitable that there will be some people, maybe even you, that at some point fall under sin's weight. And so how do we as Christ followers, how are we to act towards that person? And we have a long history of the church that, that the pendulum has swung either way. Either do absolutely nothing and let people get away with it, right? Or the other side, criticize, judge, shame, you know, make a public spectacle of them. And Paul says neither one of those is the right way to go. Paul's response is to restore. Now, here's with our community time. The word for restore here means to reset a bone that has been broken or fractured. A bone that has been broken or fractured. It's actually used a couple times in um, fixing um, fishing nets. But the main meaning is, is a broken bone or a fractured bone and put it back together. Uh, when I was about 11 or 12, 13, something like that, I was playing hockey, and um, the puck went into the corner. I went after it. Um, two, other, two or three other guys went after. Uh, one puck, three guys. You can do the math, right? And uh, my stick got caught in my skate. I fell, boom, bang, crash. And nobody had to tell me what had happened. I knew I had broken my ankle. Um, I started to weep. I started using words my mother told me I shouldn't use. And uh, so my trainer, the trainer got on the ice and my 
players, they got me off, they got me into the training room. My foot was, my ankle already swollen to the point where they couldn't get my skate off. And so the trainer said, look, we gotta get the skate off so we can get you to the hospital. So I'm gonna have to reset your ankle. So here's a towel, bite down on it. So I grabbed the towel, I put it in my mouth. He went on three, one, two, we never got to three. And uh, got the skate off, got to the hospital. You know, I got a cast, all that kinds of things. You know, restoration, when you're talking about restoring a fracture of a bone, it hurts and it takes a long time. And when you're talking about restoring a life, a person's life, at times it's going to hurt. And it's probably going to take a long time. (laughs) And that's why you've got to be gentle. And that's why Paul adds that word. But think about it. If someone is overwhelmed or has been wrestled down by sin, the most loving thing we can do to love one another as I have loved you is to try to restore that person back to a right relationship with God and themselves, right? But it, it hurts, and, it, and it's difficult. It's difficult, right? Because we, especially in America, you know, personal issues <laughs> are my personal issues. You know, why are you getting involved in my personal issues? That's tough for us in America to do. And yet Paul encourages us to do this. And, and so again, uh, uh, as Paul t- talks about um, that restoration, you know, I don't think we see a lot of it in, a, in America because despite all the issues with our healthcare system, our, you know, there are a gazillion countries in our world that would take our healthcare system in like a second. <laughs> okay, I mean, you know, maybe you've had bad experiences with them, with it, but you go so many places in the world and you can see the consequences of people who have fractured or broken something and they've not been able to get it fixed properly. And it has dramatic effects on their lives. Not just physically, but emotionally, psychologically, economically, relationship-wise. And so this idea of restoration is so important for us to take seriously. And we need to do it carefully. There may be times when there needs to be correction or even rebuke, but those aren't aren't the first things that we try to do. Those aren't the best tools that can be used for restoring a life. It's patience. It's gentleness. It's tenderness. Those are the tools that we are to use. And so that's the first instruction we get here from Paul. The next is verses 3 to 10. Paul kind of shifts now his emphasis and warns us concerning our own vulnerabilities, making sure we don't become, making sure we don't become overwhelmed by sin. And I've paraphrased these a little bit. They're going to be on the screen. Here's some points he makes. Don't take pride over your, don't let pride take over your own life. Right? It's so easy if you see a person overwhelmed by sin to go, oh boy, I'm sure they're glad I'm not like them. I'm sure glad I'm more spiritually mature than they are. That's, that's, the, that's a bad idea. <laughs> okay? Second, don't collect knowledge and not share it with others. So, see, these are things that must have been happening in the, in, in the church in Galatia. You know, because these two, they, don't really, they, they connect a little bit, but they're, they're not a direct connection. So Paul's been hearing some things, and now he just starts kind of riffing as he's writing his letter. He just, he's just, you know, oh yeah, I, I got to make sure I say something about that. Do you, do you understand? Okay. Another one. Pleasing the flesh will bring eternal destruction, but pleasing the Spirit will bring eternal life. Obviously, there's some people teaching in the Galatia churches, oh, don't worry about the eternal life. Don't, you're saved. Oh, you're saved. Once you're saved, you're always saved. So, you know, f- fulfill your own desires. Don't, don't worry about it. You're saved. You see how thinking goes? And then next, whatever one has acquired should be used for the good of others. So somehow, people are hoarding or they're not sharing with others the blessings that God has given to them. And they're kind of like, eh, you know. 
you know, Shelly, I know she doesn't have as much as, but it's not my fault. I mean, she, she needs to work harder. She, you know, or she needs to do something more. Or, you see how this is working? And he even says in the letter, don't be deceived. He, Paul talks like that. So there's some deception going on here in the church. Uh, and again, at first, these thoughts, they may seem like they don't connect. Um, but if you inspect them a little closer and you read between the lines, Paul is getting at some issues in this church. And in verse 7, Paul says this, God cannot or will not be mocked. A person reaps what they sow. Or a person, you know, will gain a harvest in their life in the way they plant. And we know that, right? If you think about an analogy, Paul uses an analogy of a farmer, which, you know, everybody grew their own crops back then. It was, you know... Um, substance. Uh, it was, you know, what you, you grew, what you ate, what you grew, or what you raised. That's the way people lived back then. Um, and so Paul uses this analogy. If you think about it, it's not those that harvest who, you know, control the crop. It's those that plant. And so Paul says, you not only need to plant seed, you need to plant the best seed, and you need to plant a whole bunch of it. And then you're going to have a good crop. Okay? And then he applies that to our lives. Now, the one thing you need to be careful here is you can't take Paul's statement as a 100% guarantee. If you go back to the farmer analogy, a farmer can plant really good seed and plant it all over the place, but if it doesn't rain enough or it rains too much, right? Or if it rains at the wrong time, there is no harvest. So Paul isn't making this sort of 100% guarantee. He's just saying, all things being equal, if a farmer plants well, they'll get a good crop. And if we plant good spiritual seed, all things being equal, our life will have a good harvest. That's what Paul is saying here. It's, it's very practical advice that Paul is giving. But somehow, people are not believing that, and so Paul puts in this phrase, God cannot or will not be mocked. And that word for mocked here means one who turns up their nose or sneers or treats another as a fool. In other words, Paul says, go ahead, knock yourself out and sneer or, or make a, try to make a fool out of God. And see how well that goes. <laughs> There's a challenge here that Paul is making to these deceivers. And so Paul says, stop planting seeds of discontent, lies, false teaching, and shaming. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't simply say, stop this behavior. He says, replace it with a walking or living in the spirit behavior. And here are three, three things he points out. The first one is take care of those who give you spiritual instruction. Paul struggled with this his whole life. As he's called out as an apostle, he constantly writes churches to say, can you support me? God has called me into the ministry, full-time ministry. I'm trying to make tents on my own to make a little bit of money, but I need some support. Why are you being so selfish? And I just want to say, in front of all of you, for the number of years that I've been here at Northminster, you guys have done this very, very well. <laughs> you have supported myself and my family um, and met our basic material needs. So, thank you. Thank you. We, I just appreciate it so much. I mean, you could be a little more generous with your laughing at my jokes. But other than that, you've done really well. But, you know, it just, just isn't about material needs, right? Uh, I think what Paul is also saying here is that we have shared in the fellowship and ministry of the Holy Spirit together. You know, there have been people here at the church that when I was going through some difficult times or times of doubt or struggle, they surrounded me and they cared for me and they encouraged me. That's part of the deal. Two, Intentionally spend time and effort seeking the things of God, not the things of the flesh. Things of God, not the things of the flesh. And again, friends, I, think, I don't think Paul here is talking 
primarily about material things. He's not saying, well, hey, if you drive a car that's newer than 1997, you're not walking in the Spirit, right? Or, hey, I heard you went to the gem show last week and bought some jewelry. You need to return that because you're living in the flesh. That, 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 that seems silly to me. I, I think what Paul's talking about here is more goes to the mind and the heart. You know, he's, he's saying, where is your heart? Do we allow our hearts to hold a grudge? You know, do we allow our thoughts to, to center on impure things? Do we wallow in self-pity? Do we let anxiousness and uncertainty fuel our lives? Or do we depend on other people's opinions to shape our identity and how we see ourselves? <laughs> Those are the real issues I think Paul is getting at here. And so Paul says what? Well, you need to spend more time in prayer. You know, how do you walk in the Spirit? More time in prayer. A little more time in God's Word. More time serving others. And remind yourself over and over again that your identity rests in Christ and what He has already accomplished for you and how He sees you. Third, use the gifts and talents God has given you to benefit all people. Do you notice that? He said all people. Oh my gosh. Not just people in the church. Not just your friends. Not just other Christians. All people. Now Paul doesn't tell us what the harvest will look like when we do this. Because that isn't the point. That's really not the point Paul is making. Paul is saying in God's created order, it is proven over and over again that as we share our time, talent, knowledge, experience, material resources, whatever, with others, either inside or outside the church, people and the community will benefit. Right? The, our, the shower unit out here. They, they, don't, they don't ask you, so have you been to church lately? You know, hey, are you a Christian? Oh, well, oh, you're not? Oh, you can have a shower, but it'll be cold. <laughs> right, only the Christians get the hot showers. If you're not a Christian, you get one shoe, not two. Right, that's... And so what is Paul saying here? Paul is saying, as Christians, we are to be good citizens. We are to be good citizens. If you're a teacher teach the best you can. If you're a lawyer, you lawyer the best you can. If, you know, if you're, whatever you, be the best you can and treat people around you the best you can. Be a good citizen. Let me end with a story. It's a story I heard from Tim Keller. Tim Keller is a, he used to be the pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City. It's quite the place to be a pastor of in New York City, uh, as you can imagine. And he's also just an incredible writer, very thoughtful, uh, very uh, excellent cultural observer. And while he was a pastor at Redeemer, um, he would notice this woman, uh, young woman, younger woman, she would come in and out of the sanctuary, but she'd always come late and leave early, right? And uh, one day, he wasn't preaching. Uh, one of the other pastors was preaching, and so he caught up with her, and uh, he started talking to her, and, uh, you know, said, I know she come to redeem her, but you kind of leave, you know, come in late, leave early. She said, yeah, yeah, but I, I enjoy it. She said, you know, I'm not really sure if I believe everything you're saying, <laughs> and uh, I'm not really sure if I buy in to the whole Christian thing, but I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. And uh, he said, well, then, you know, why did you start coming? And she shared this story with him. She said, well, I am um, employed at a, uh, one of the entertainment companies here in New York City. It's a very famous one. And she said, and I messed up. I messed up really bad. Like career ending bad. And uh, I found out that my boss, uh, and I was ready to be fired. She said, I was ready to be fired. But then I found out, uh, after I wasn't fired, I kept waiting to be fired, and I wasn't, I found out a little later, my boss, who has a, an incredible amount of credibility 
and, and, and respect among my bosses. He, they, he went in and took the blame for me. He said, look, I, I know she made a mistake, and, you know, but if you're going to blame anybody, blame me. You know, I, didn't, I should have spent a little more time with her, trained her a little better, walked alongside her. So don't fire her. If you're going to blame anybody, blame me. And then she, she said, and then I found this out, and so I, I would go and visit him, like almost every week. And I would try to find out, you know, why did you do this? Because her experience with all the bosses that she had ever had, especially in that industry, if she did something really well, they would take all the credit. <laughs> right? But if she slipped up just a minute, oh, no, it was her. Yeah, she did that. <laughs> right? But this guy did something completely, from her point of view, unnatural. And so she kept bugging him and bugging him and bugging him. And the only thing he would say is, don't worry about it. It's okay. You know, it's no big thing. I just felt like, you know, you deserve the second chance. Da, da, da. But she wouldn't give up. And so finally, one day in his office, this is what um, he said to her. He said, okay, I'm going to say this once. And remember, you, you made me say it. I'm a Christian. <laughs> I'm a Christian. And my whole life is based on a man who took the blame for me. And I try to let that shape the way I live my whole life. And then she asked him, do you go to church? And he said, yes. And then she said, what church do you go to? <laughs> and he said, Redeemer, Presbyterian. So she started attending. That is a great example of what Paul is doing here. And what Paul is telling us to do here. He is saying our life should be fueled by the law of Christ. Not human law. Not do this because you'll get in trouble, or do this because it'll make you look good, or do this because it's, you'll get some social cred. Do this, act like this, live like this towards others, because that is what Christ has done for you. That's the difference between law and grace, friends. That's the difference between living a life controlled by the law and living a life controlled by grace. And it makes all the difference in the world. <laughs> he says, live a life fueled by the law of Christ. And, and it looks like, and, and, and what that looks like, right? And as you seek to live out that kind of life in your daily lives, wherever God has put you, you are planting seeds of gospel ministry in the lives of others and the harvest and you may see it you may not that's not the point but there will be a harvest and that harvest will be that people's lives will be changed they'll be changed in ways that christ has changed your life let's pray lord thanks for this time thanks for your word May we live a life by and fueled by the law of Christ, the way you have loved us. Help us to love others. In Jesus' name, amen. I think we got a song. Do we have a response? No. Yeah. Oh, we do. Yeah, before we sing. I'm um, sorry. It's okay. Ken forgot about me. It's all right. No. Um, uh, before we sing, I wanted to um, read our scripture again, but in a different version. It's called The Message. Um, often in preparation for the service um, throughout the week, I'll read the coming scripture for the coming Sunday, and sometimes I'll read it in different versions because it helps, I think, God speak to me. And I just really liked the way that um, our scripture was laid out in the message version. The message is written in a more contemporary um, way and language. So, and I think it just gave, it, it spoke to my heart for sure, and it gave me some good, good uh, thoughts. So it says, live creatively, friends. If someone falls into sin, forgivingly restore him, saving your critical comments for yourself. You might be needing forgiveness before the day's out. 
Stoop down and reach out to those who are oppressed. Share their burdens and so complete Christ's law. If you think you are too good for that, you are badly deceived. Make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you have been given, and then sink yourself into that. Don't be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself to others. Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own life. Be very sure now, you, you who have been trained to the self-sufficient maturity, that you enter into a generous common life with those who have trained you, sharing all the good things that you have and experience. Don't be misled. No one makes a fool of God. What a person plants, he will harvest. The person who plants selfishness, ignoring the needs of others, ignoring God, harvests a crop of weeds. And he who, and he'll have to show for his life is weeds. But the one who plants in response to God, letting God's spirit do the growth work in him, harvests a crop of real life, eternal life. So let's not allow ourselves to get fatigued doing good. At the right time, we will harvest a good crop if we don't give up or quit. Right now, therefore, every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. Isn't that cool? <laughs> all right, so now we will stand and sing as soon as Julia is up. All right, let's, let's sing one more song together.
Thank you so much. Great song. Uh, just remind you, if you filled out the white cards, we've got boxes here in the front and back. Put those in. Our offering baskets are also on top there. We've got some ministry tables out in the courtyard and some coffee and lemonade and cookies. Uh, our shower unit is out right by the basketball court if you just want to go and take a visit. Uh, and as we leave this place and enter into uh, the week, uh, just a great reminder that this song reminds us maybe uh, there's someone here uh, or you know of someone who is wandering, who needs some restoration. And Jesus says, I'm here. I'm the great restorer. And I can restore your life. I can restore anybody's life. And you know what Paul talks about today? It's tough when we see a person overwhelmed by sin and to try to figure out how to insert ourselves because we love that person. And so pray about it. Do it gently. But know that that is what it means to walk and to live by the Spirit. So may you know God's blessing. May you know His mercy and His grace in your life, in your family's life, in your friend's life this week. Go in peace. Amen.